We are back on the Building Equity Podcast. I'm James Schlimmer. And I'm John Bowens. I tell you what, we got a guest here. We're going to introduce him in just a second. Today's show, John Bowens, we're talking about a guide to property management for real estate investors, new real estate investors here in 2022, how to manage a property. I've been waiting two seasons for this show right here because I know the hardest thing to do for real estate investors is how to manage a property. We got an expert right next to us. I'm really excited about this episode, James, uh, particularly because with a self-directed IRA or self-directed 401k, Roth IRA, other tax advantage investment account, there are certain rules that you have to follow. And I find many investors, although they don't need to, I find many investors prefer to use a licensed property management company. And so Dave, really excited to have you on the show today to talk about the various aspects of property management and what to look at in terms of potentially self-managing versus using a property management company. Uh, James, before we do that, I think we should talk we gotta about- We got to stick to the rules. We got to stick to the rules, yeah. which of course is, this is for educational purposes only. So we like to provide a lot of information, a lot of education to our viewers, but what we don't do is provide tax, legal, or financial advice, or endorse or recommend any one individual investment company or other third party. Um, that being said, James, before we jump into the questions for Dave, uh, did you want to talk about our sponsor, IRA Title Pro? We do have a sponsor, and it's a wonderful thing. So if you are using your self-directed IRA to buy and sell real estate, let me tell you, there's thousands and thousands, Dave, throughout the country. You need to know about IRA Title Pro. So head over to IRAtitlepro.com, where you're going to actually work with a closing team, experienced closing team that knows IRA real estate transfers. You can close on average 11 days faster. Stop being the middleman. No, you don't have to provide trust documents because it's not a trust. We know all the hardships you go through when working with a local title company. And the most important thing is that when you're on IRAtitlepro.com, take a look at the resources tab. You'll see the drop down. We've got a suite of tools and resources for you to use at every step of your journey, whether you're buying, selling, or lending. So head over to IRAtitlepro.com. Flawless, John Bowens. Did you hear that? That was outstanding, James, Man. as always. And, and I'll mention to all of our, our viewers and, and audience members is uh, when closing on real estate transactions, and I personally have been involved in many real estate transactions, I've also had the opportunity to help hundreds of thousands of real estate investors purchase properties using their self-directed IRAs, 401ks, and various other retirement plans. And I can speak from firsthand experience. If you're working with a title company that is uneducated on the matters related to self-directed IRA investing, it can be very painful yep. for you as an investor, potentially costly for you as an investor, as well as also very painful for the other parties involved, particularly a seller. So I encourage folks to check out IRAtitlepro.com. Uh, James, if you want to jump right into the initial questions, I have a lot of questions here for Dave. Yep. Um, but before I get to my questions, let me set the table here. Okay. One, we're sitting here with Dave Piscarek of Parkline Realty in South Florida, right? I've known Dave for a while, right? Dave is over 20 years in this business. He's literally done everything, whether it be from property management, from real estate agent to broker, sits on the board of directors for, you know, a 6,500 agent uh, board down here in Naples, Florida. Dave has been there and done it. And let me just tell you a true story. Maybe three, four years ago, I sit down to lunch with David. And I'm like, hey, I've got these two investment properties where I'm going to get some tenants in there and I'm going to be, uh, you know, trying this out. He flat out looks me in the face, John Bowens, and he goes, he's like, you're too nice. It's not going to work. You're too nice. And I'm like, ah, what do you mean? It's like, no big deal. It's two properties. It's going to be super simple. No big deal. Mm, you're too nice. And I'm like, well, what do you charge and how does that work? And I just, it's not that I thought it was too expensive or anything. I just, I thought, oh, I'll just do it. Like no big deal, right? Like an idiot, right? Sure enough, we were way too nice. Sure enough, we got taken advantage of like crazy. Sure enough, I wanted to bring an expert on our show so you can feel like we've got the best possible information for our investors that are watching. And I'm sitting here with Dave Piscarek, so thank you. And I gotta, I gotta jump in here for a second, James. And I'm sure Dave will mention this, uh, but I'll, I'll jump into it a little bit early sure. on here. Is I think what you may have failed to do, and Dave, feel free to jump in here, is you didn't separate, separate ownership from management. Even if you are called an owner operator, you have to be able to separate that ownership versus management. 
and there's a distinct difference between the two. Would you agree with that, Dave? A hundred percent. You know, you got to look at it from as a business, and this is what I told you. I believe at that at that lunch, it, you it's really hard to separate your your personal ownership and how you feel about that home. Yep. With the business aspect of it, and that even goes true for my own home. Um, I own a home, but in Naples, and I decided to rent it out because we moved to a different home, and I even made the mistake of not separating the business aspect of it. I let them pay late. They took advantage of me, and this is what I do for a business. But for some reason, I felt because it was my home that it was okay, that it, it would work out. I would figure it out, and ultimately, obviously, I did. But I still made that mistake, and I think next time I would let my other property managers handle my property so that I don't have an involvement with it. That way, I keep it strictly business. I'm sure you're going to say the same thing here, but let's uh, to get right in the top three mistakes that new real estate investors make when it comes to property management. Okay, well, we started with one of them, right? In, in no particular order. I think one of the biggest, though, is to is to not try to do it yourself, especially if you're new to real estate and you're new to this business. Um, get a team, you know, put a team together, work with a local agent, realtor, a property manager, learn the local market. There's going to be more desirable areas. There's going to be less desirable areas. When I say less desirable, it doesn't mean they're bad. It just means that maybe they're not conducive of rental rentals. Um, you know, you may... It, it's easy to fall into the trap of buying a place where there's a ton of rentals in that neighborhood. Well, all that does is create competition, keeps your prices down. And then on your resale, maybe you don't have the equity in there. So, I, you know, I always try to look for a place where it's a high demand. People want to live, but they can't necessarily afford to purchase there. Maybe they can't come up with a down payment or whatever. They might want to rent or they might want to fill the area out um, just to see if they like it before they... Uh, you know, they, they go and live there. So you're going to have a lot of people that want to rent. And if there's nothing to rent, then they can't do it. So, you know, that's that's one of the things. I think, you know, you, you can have a good real estate agent, a good property manager, combined with a CPA, an insurance agent, all the things that people need when purchasing a home. Um, it, it, it's, it's so important. And a lot of times they don't have a plan going into this and they're figuring out at the last minute. Or so where does it go wrong? And is it because I'm trying to self-manage this, I'm too attached to this one property or I get taken advantage of, which I know in my case, we were we were just way too nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the more the more you give in to, you know, um, complaints or demands or somebody says, you know, this doesn't work, that doesn't work. Exactly. This yeah. is, a lot of times they do work. They just don't work up to their I don't know what they think it should be, right? Yep. And so it's your home, so you take this pride in it, and you're not looking at it as a business. You're looking at it as I got to take care of my home to make them happy, as if they're a guest in your home. You're not hosting them; they're living in your home. They need to somewhat maintain that. And uh, yeah, you, you just you just have to cut that tie, and um, you, you got to know where to draw the line as well, because if you don't, if you don't draw the line and say, "Listen, um, this is a, a tenant responsibility." You need to change your own air conditioning filter. You need to clean the vent um, in the dryer, things like that. If they think they can call you, and you're gonna, you're just gonna jump and do it because it's your house. You're gonna call you. You're gonna keep calling you, and it's gonna be a full time job for you, and it's no fun. And and you're not getting paid. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up, Dave, because what I've learned in working with investors and being an investor myself is, um, I've really been on both sides. Uh, so I've, I've been the person that. They call me and I'm over there within 15 minutes. If they lock themselves out, I'm over there within 15 minutes. If the you know window lock is broke, I'm over there in 15 minutes because I'm worried that if I don't do that, that they won't call me when there's something that's really bad that could create massive damage in the property, like some sort of plumbing leak, even worse, a potential gas leak. You know, Now there's a tremendous amount of liability there. And so having a balance is really, really important. And I think that's where a good property management company comes into play. A property management company that's going to have the systems in place so that when they have a maintenance order, they put in the maintenance order, and then there's an appropriate level of response time that's provided to that tenant. That way, I'm serving the tenant well, and I'm making sure that I'm mitigating my risk. And I'm also getting my time back. So that way, when we're out of town, or if it's a Saturday night at 7 o'clock, and dinner's ready to come off the grill, I'm not getting a phone call and having to drop everything and drive over to that property. Yeah. Um, as it relates to self-directed IRA investing, really, really important because the rule of thumb that has to be used is 
In most cases, it's okay to do the desk work. And again, this is a rule of thumb. It's okay to do the desk work, but you shouldn't be doing the physical sweat equity. And for some people, it's really hard to distinguish between those two. And so for that reason, there's plenty of folks out there that would prefer when using an IRA, 401k, or the retirement plan to hire a property management company. So this leads me to the question, Dave, and we have viewers from all over the country. I understand that you're here in Naples, Florida, servicing the Naples, Florida marketplace. Um, and so certainly for somebody that's in the Naples, Florida area, uh, they can find your information in the show notes down below. Uh, but for somebody that might be you know, out of state, out of the state of Florida, um, what should they do to find a property management company? Um, just first, how, how, do they, how do they find one? And then secondarily, how do they interview and make a decision on what property management company to use? Well, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. It, I think you know one of the top things people do to look for a property management company is they Google it or they do a web search of some sort. And, you, and that's a great way. I think if you, um, you know, I don't want to promote anything, but I use Thumbtack and allpropertymanagement.com. Sure. Places like that are a good place to go and, and find who's in the local market and um, look at the reviews, you know, like truly look at the reviews that they get from the tenants and their owner. Um, but word of mouth is really a big thing. You know, being a realtor, I have a good portion of my business that comes from other realtors because they rely on me and they trust me. So they say, we know that this is what he does. And, you know, they put their con their client in contact with me. Now, when they go to sell again, I unfortunately, sometimes I have to send them back to their to whoever referred them. But sometimes they don't. Uh, but I think, you know, between web searches and uh, word of mouth and referrals is probably. So, uh, so you really can good. not only let's say, for example, I'm an out of state. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, by the way. Oh, and you should have told me that I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah, we're going to have a big feud. Then. There we yeah. go. Big, big feud. Uh, well, not so much anymore, quite frankly. But um, yeah, at, at any rate, if I'm from Cleveland. Uh, let's say I want to buy investment property down here in, in Naples, Florida. Um, I reach out to you. Are you in a position where you can not only help someone find a property, but then you also will step in as the property management company? In other words, um, I'm reaching out to one person rather than reaching out to one person and then having to separately try to find a property management company or rely on you right. to refer me to a reputable property management company. We handle it all. So we can literally be a one-stop a one shop. We can help you find the appropriate investment property that suits your needs. Um, and we can take over the management for you. We can assist you on the maintenance aspects of it as well. I mean, I have a maintenance background. I Sometimes I get involved and I try to separate myself from that sort of equity. But we have a lot of contacts in town with um, the vendors. You know, we, we work with certain preferred vendors. There's, um, it, it, when I say a preferred, a preferred vendor, it is just somebody that I know does a good job. They may not always be the cheapest, but they're not the most expensive. And I know they're not going to take advantage of me. They're going to get the job done. They're going to get it done right in, in accordance to how we um, we, or what our expectations are. So yeah, you can contact me for everything. And uh, for folks that, um, let's say, because I understand that there's, you know, across the country, there are real estate brokers who operate in a similar capacity that have that model of, you know, they'll help you find it, find a property, investment property that suits your needs, and then also step in on the property management side. Mm -hmm. um, what are some questions as an investor I can ask in that interviewing process, um, how do I maybe get referrals? Uh, is there a way for me to maybe talk to another client? I know sometimes that could be difficult, but what are some things that as an investor, um, this obviously in this case, we talk a lot about self-directed IRAs. You know, I could be putting a good portion of my retirement savings into one individual asset. Yep. Now, from my perspective, I I'm comfortable with that, providing that it's, it's a solid asset. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the investors I work with they don't want to invest in the traditional stock market. They want to invest in real estate, sure. even if that means having almost their entire retirement account, IRA, 401k, the retirement plan into one individual property. So what, what types of questions would I want to be asking this individual? Sure. I get a lot of questions and I'm just sitting here and I'm trying to think of, but I think you know, one of the important questions that I think a lot of people ask me is, you know, how long does the average client stick around with me? How long have they been my client and my customer and on average most of my clients are with me for 10 years or more which i think is a great that's a great track record if you're a client can stick sure. with you for 10 years sure. um, i think that's an important question to have if they have a lot of turnover that means they're not happy they're going and they're looking for something better dave tell me how important is it to avoid these nightmare stories that you hear about where does 
you know, proper screening techniques. And again, a lot of our investors, they are self-managing. Do you have any kind of X's and O's and say, hey, you know, this is how you should screen tenants? Absolutely. So first thing we do is we put in place a resident selection criteria. You want to put that on your website. You want to accompany it with a, a very thorough rental application. You want to get as many questions on that application as you can. Ask them if they've ever been evicted, if they've been convicted of a crime. Um, all these things. So that later on, if you find out that they were and they lied about it, you can utilize that as, as a means to either get them out of the property yep. or to not rent to them. But we utilize a, um, a property management software that has everything built in. So I have an online rental application. The tenant submits the application along with their ID and such, and they acknowledge that they read the resident criteria, so on and so forth. And then also built into the software, we just order the background check from right there. Now there's two ways to go about that. You can pay a little extra and you can just run the credit check and get it all immediately or there's a basic version of it where you know you can even charge it back to the tenant and they fill out their information and verify their ID. But in within the resident criteria, you wanna outline what it is that you're looking for. If, and there's a criminal history of any kind, you wanna you want to put dates in there, you know, it has to be seven or 10 years from a misdemeanor or so on and so forth. No drug offenses, no murder. Yep. Things like that. Um, even if credit score, if you if you are going to look at it and say we're not going to accept anybody that doesn't have a 700 or better credit score, I mean you could do it. I wouldn't advise you to do that because there's some really good people out there that you're going to miss out on. Um, also, income verification. You want to verify that they can actually afford the place and that it's their 75 percent of their income isn't going to paying rent. So, for instance, we require um, a combined monthly income of three times the monthly rent. Yep which is pretty standard around here. Let me ask this question too. Is it, it's probably a wrong, uh, a wrong philosophy for somebody who is renting properties as an investor in Cleveland to believe that landlord tenant law is the same in Ohio as it is in Florida, where they're maybe from, right? It's different yeah. in every state? It's completely different. Yeah. Okay. yeah, you wanna definitely look into finding a property manager um, in that local area that understands the local registration and the state or, or regulations. Um, because some local have restrictions, and they have regulations. You got to register the property, like you a bed to tax. If you're bed doing tax, short-term rentals, if you're yeah. doing yeah, short-term rentals, seasonal rentals, things like that. You have to register the home. You have to let the, the county know that it's a rental. It's a fifty dollars fee. It's really easy. There's state tourist tax, and in each county it's different here in Florida. And I'm 100% positive it's completely different in Ohio. I've never managed any properties in Ohio, yep. but I'd have to assume um, that it's that it's a lot different. So. I think that's really important. I'm glad you brought that up, James. And Dave, maybe you could speak to this a little bit, is the, the laws in that particular state or in that particular county are really, really important because as a landlord, by having a property management company that is doing everything that they're supposed to be doing, it mitigates your risk of doing something that could be considered against fair housing laws sure. or other laws in that particular jurisdiction. So is there anything to, to add to that, Dave, from... Yeah, you know, each state, like Florida, has its own tenant, um, you know, the Sunshine Laws, and they have, um, they have ten Florida, what's it called, the uh, Tenant and Landlord Act. Yep. Um, you know, so I'm sure each state has one of those, and so, yeah, it's, it's extremely important. Um, one of the things you said, and it slipped my mind. Um, I'm going to jump in and please. just say that. I went blind. No, it's okay. Do you know how often I hear folks say, I am not letting a dog in this house? And all of a sudden, service dog comes across on the application and you don't handle that the correct way. You open yourself up to severe liability. That's and, a great point. And if you think, I mean, we know that there are folks that go through people's websites, law firms that are looking to see if your website yeah. is ADA compliant. There are folks that are just looking to see if you turn their dog down or their service yeah. animal. How do you address that, Dave? The Look them up on Facebook and see if they're holding their pet in your living room. No, um, that <laughs> that's a good idea. That's a good idea. You'd we be surprised. Facebook stalking on the show. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So no, but that is one of the things. Um, we asked those questions on the rental applications. Do you have a pet? And they answered several times. Even in the lease, it's in there that you cannot have pets without you know written permission from the landlord. Um, so right then and there, you know, if you find out that they do have a pet, you need to approach them. It's a violation of the lease. You give them seven, day, seven days to cure that violation. How are they want to cure it? I don't know. You want to get rid of the dog? I don't yeah, know. Yeah. But uh, it, it's a violation or ask for approval. You know, when it comes to service animals, there's really not much you can do. You know, you have to, if, if someone has a pet, has a dog, and uh, you don't want dogs, but it's a service animal, like it's a true service animal, 
there's nothing you can do. And so that's one of the things that we have built into our management contract in our agreement with the owners is, listen, we're not going to violate fair housing laws sure. or service animal, you know, things like that. So another violation that you really got to be careful with in different states is uh, security deposits and prepaid rents, things like that. Um, they vary and they need to be treated uh, very carefully. They usually need to be separated from the operating funds and, and kept because technically that's the tenant's money. That's not your money as an owner. It, you're holding it there in case they damage something. And then you have to make a claim on it. You don't just get to take it. That's a, re that's a really good point. I want to pause there for a moment because a, a lot of investors ask me about that specifically, mm -hmm. especially as it pertains to using a self-directed IRA is the commingling of the rent money versus the security deposit. And I think you you said it well, Dave, which is, you know, that security deposit is not the landlord or the property management's money. They can't take that money and consider it profit. That needs to go back to the tenant unless obviously the tenant does something to warrant you taking that money. Mm -hmm. um, how does that work when you're using a property management company mm -hmm. as the investor, do I have to go with you as the property management company to set up a, a separate bank account? Is that something you guys handle all internally? Well, we, we handle that. So we have the bank accounts in place for all of our clients. We'll have a rental operating account. We have a security deposit escrow account. And um, really, it's this is another really good reason to make sure you do use a property manager because you don't want the liability 100%. of holding those funds. Yeah. And so we assume that liability for you and make sure that you stay in compliance you know, a lot of times people don't realize prepaid rent. If they, if someone pays a month in advance, yep. I, and then this happens to me where an owner knows they paid me a month, two, three months in advance, and they say, "Well, aren't you going to send me the money?" And I say, "No, it's not your money yet. It's not your money until it becomes due, and they're paying on a monthly basis. So you got to hold it, and then you apply it to the income, rental income, and such, and then you transfer it to them. So that's that's very important. And you know what happens where it makes it easy too from the title side is there's no conflict. So just before closing, if a third-party property management company isn't holding the money, typically the title company handles those prorations for advanced rents, right? One of the first things that we do is we reach out to the investor, and they fill out what they call a landlord estoppel. And they let us know, hey, how much advanced rent did you collect? How much was it? When did, this folk, uh, when did they make their last rent payment? What was the security deposit? And so forth. But then we also send what they call a tenant estoppel. Mm -hmm. And when that tenant estoppel, it should match. But if it doesn't, so for instance, they say, hey, there was no security deposit. And now they say, well, I had a $5,000 security deposit. Now you have a conflict and you have an argument and you have a del closing delay. Whereas if all of that is held by a third party property management company, we're out of it. It's simple. It's very simple for that money to transfer over because they have it. They just take the new owner out, pop the new owner in. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think we should move on now to, uh, Dave would love to talk a little bit about um, the deliverables to a client. If, if I hire a property management company, what should I be expecting from that property management company from a, call it data reporting perspective? Mm -hmm. So that is, you know, monthly reports or quarterly reports. That's a great um, question. Monitoring expenses. I have counseled, if you will, not legal counsel, because I'm not an attorney, um, but I've worked with individual investors one-on-one -on -one where they come to me and they have a property management company and they, they look at their returns and they're saying, what's going on here? And we start to peel back layers of the onion and we look at all of the expenses and we start finding expenses in there that, you know, we have to look at a little skeptically, you know, was that really a necessary expense? Right. And so... Um, you know, what as an investor to protect our principal and protect our cash flow, what should we expect from a property management company in terms of reports, deliverables, and how do we best monitor what that property management company actually is or is not doing? Sure. Well, that's a great question. Well, great question. We, um, we utilize a service, um, a property management software that is, it's web-based, so the client can access it. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They can go on, they can pull a report, they can see if their tenant paid, they can look up the income and loss or profit and loss or income and expense statement, or we call it a rental owner statement. They can see how much cash they have available to be dispersed, if any. Um, obviously, they have to expect that there are going to be some unexpected repairs. Um, 
you know, service calls for a handyman for disposals, things like that. A lot of times, um, tenants can take care of those things, but it's best if they come through us anyways, and we'll get a better price. But uh, you should look, some of the expenses you can anticipate are maybe a lease preparation fee, management fees, leasing fees. Most leasing fees are one-time fees. It really depends on the management company's structure and how they, how they collect it. Um, what else? Uh, what other expenses can you expect? I don't know. What do you, what oh, do you have in mind and, exactly? And so you said you looked at some skeptical. Like, what would be a skeptical expense? Yeah, you know, looking at you know, let's say there's, um, uh, let's say a new fluid master and flapper needs to get put into okay. a toilet, right? And so obviously the property management company is going to have a fee for yep. in taking that call, a service fee, so to speak. And then obviously you have the fee which is associated with the property management company actually writing a check to the plumber, whatever that, that hard cost is there. Gotcha. So what would someone reasonably expect in terms of like a service related fee like that, you know, plus the, the charge paid to the plumber um, and looking at that obviously in comparable rates in that particular market. For example, it's right. a fluid master and flapper. I saw once where it was a fluid, it was obviously a fluid master and flapper and it was yep. a $500 fee. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> that is not a $500 fee. Sure. Yeah, that's probably not a great management company. And so, but yeah, it is a fee-based business, right? So every time we do something, we are going to charge a fee. I don't charge markup on my management fees um, or maintenance. If, if they call us or they put in a request through our online system, um, we'll, we'll coordinate that. We'll get the vendor there and whatever their cost is. I mean, I do everything it costs. It's just a pass-through. It's, we're using their money. So I don't mark it up. A lot of companies do charge up 10, 20%. Um, we don't do that. Sounds like a great question while you're looking for a property management company as we talk about the fees. Yeah. You know, you right. could, you know, accept whether it's the first month's rent is going to the property management company or, you know, $99 a month every single month or a flat fee. But yeah. you want to know this up front so there's no surprises. And then I would imagine it'd be great to know every month, oh yeah, we did have our toilet fixed. And right. why is that 500 bucks as opposed to seeing it when you go to do your taxes, you know? Yeah, yeah. and you have to realize too, say a handyman goes out and buys a fluid map, fluid master flap or toilet part. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's, you know, if we buy it, it's gonna be a cost. If they provide it, they can mark it up and we don't have control over what they do. You know, mm -hmm. So if they paid 1095 for it and they wanna charge you 20, then they can do that. They went, they picked it up, they delivered it, they installed it, they removed the old one. So. You can't just see it as black and white. Like, I know this costs eleven ninety five. I only want to be charged eleven ninety five. Well, right. they got in their car, they went, picked it up, they brought it, they installed it, they got rid of the old one. So there's there's more to it than just black and white picking it up in Home Depot. It doesn't install itself. So right. there's gonna there's gonna be some up charges, and a lot of companies do charge uh, markup and up charges, and it's not a bad thing. Um, I consider doing it myself. It's a it's a cost. The way I look at it is it's, it's a cost of doing business, and the time that I would have to spend to go find a vendor. Mm -hmm. that that's that's going to make sense and be able to get it done and get sure. it done proficiently proficiently um i don't even have to worry about taking that phone call and there's obviously a cost from that perspective i look at it through the lens of we've been talking a lot about self-directed iras and using retirement funds you know there are unique tax benefits associated with using an ira 401k other retirement plan particularly a roth ira mm -hmm. because it's tax-free growth and when i take the money out so as long as i'm following all the rules it's tax free. Yep. So what I might be paying, I might be paying a little bit more in the form of property management fees, service fees, things of that nature. But what am I making back on the tax free benefits? Plus, I'm getting all of my time back. That time back Huge. where I can go out and find another investment opportunity, or I can work on starting a business, or like you, James, I can serve on the board of directors with another company, or I can do service work like you like to do as well. So, you know, I think a lot about, you know, that time I get back by hiring a good, reputable property management company. Uh, now, a couple other things. I know I'm monopolizing the time a little bit here, James. It's good. So I, it's good. I know but, Dave, so we get a chance um, to talk. You know, as an investor, as someone that, you know, I'll say the people that are part of my tribe are mostly buy and hold rental property, single family rental property investors. So this is going to be super, super helpful for them to look at, okay, what do I need to be asking in terms of hiring a property management company? Um, you're paying for these expenses that come up that that incur that are incurred. Understandably, there could be a, a furnace or a bigger ticket item where I'm going to have to kick in some money. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that you guys hold some kind of slush fund. Is there like a certain percentage? Is it a certain dollar amount based on the property value? How does that work sure. in terms of how much money I have to keep escrowed? We, I mean, we personally, like my company, we keep $350 as a property reserve. 
That's what we do. Now we will advise um, you know our clients to you know keep a property reserve. If you're not going to keep it with us, to keep it in your own bank account, you probably want to put away at least 10% of the rent that you're collecting on a monthly basis. Take 10% of that and put it in an account as a property reserve. That way, that'll help you cover vacancy losses because it's inevitable. Eventually, a tenant's going to move out. You're going to have to take time to paint the place, get it ready. A, might, a month might go by where you don't have rent coming in, and that helps cover those costs. So I would say approximately 10%, but you should expect the management company to hold back anywhere between two to $500, uh, just okay. as a running balance. Okay. And Not then, every month, just, right, just a running in general. balance. Yeah. And then um, taxes, taxes and insurance, um, is that, are those generally going to be paid by the property owner directly, or is that something that would flow through you as well? Yeah, no, we, we don't. Typically, we do not pay for insurance or taxes or anything like that. Anything that could really end up in a lien and lose their property. I'm not paying the mortgage. We're not paying the insurance. We're not paying the HOA fees or the taxes. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't do it. Um, I would probably refer them to a CPA or somebody like that has more experience in accounting and taxes and things like that. But that's not a liability that we would really want to take on. Um, but if they say, hey, Dave, um, my taxes are due, and they instruct me to do it, and they say, take my rental money, instead of sending it to me, will you go online and make this payment? You know, obviously, we'll do that. You know, there is some concierge-type services where we can do and will do at their uh, request. Yeah, I got a concierge question here. Uh -oh. It's a concierge question for our, all our self-managed folks that feel like they're getting taken advantage of by their tenant where let's assume for the sake of this that the home is in, it's in good shape, and you, you touched on it earlier, um, whatever that piece may be is not working to what they believe it is, but it's right. adequate for that. Sure. What are some actionable, hey, tips and tricks for how they can handle this situation? Right. Obviously, one, hire a great property manager. First and foremost. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, have a maintenance responsibility tenant sort of manual something okay. that you can provide the tenant say listen this is what you're responsible for you know it's your responsibility to change the air condition filter on a monthly basis or three months depending on the quality of air condition filter that you buy right it could be a month it could be three months and you try to itemize as many of those things as you can for them and just give them a heads up eventually your air conditioner here in florida at least twice a year it's going to stop working because the drain line is going to get clogged with all that mm -hmm. gunky stuff it's going to need blown out it's going to need clean because the first thing a tenant does is they call and say, it's broken, I need a new air conditioner. Sure. No, you don't. You just need to lift that little piece there. And yeah. so uh, doing like what you're doing now, you make little instruction videos to show them how to do these things that they can do themselves because they can do them, do them themselves. And it doesn't make sense for me to go down there and vacuum out a line or send a, an air condition company that's going to cost you $250, $500 to go out there. You can't be mad at them for charging it. They're coming on a Sunday afternoon at yep. 3 o'clock um, because the tenant didn't know what to do and so as much as you can outline for the tenants and provide to them either whether it's, whether it's a website or you know a packet that you give them at move in that's the best way to go. it makes so much sense too because you know the home so you know the kind of uh, intricacies or you know the little troubled areas and you know he hits a nail on the head you know you're going to have backup in the ac that's going to hit the emergency valve everybody knows it yep. but if you're brand new and you just moved from minnesota you yep. may not know that You'd be surprised people do not know that yeah. It, it amazes me how many people do not know this that live, live down here all their lives and have no idea how an air conditioning system works. But So this question is going to be out of left field. If you don't like it, we won't put it in there, so we'll take it out. But I'm fascinated with the uh, energy crisis that's happening over in Europe okay. and generally, right? We talk about oil, we talk about... And when you now you have in the Northeast... And your homes, how do you heat your homes in Cleveland? Mostly gas. Occasionally you'll natural find electric gas, right? or propane if you're in a more rural area. Okay. So you could have oil, you could have natural gas, which right now natural gas is low, but Europe is supposed to just freeze this winter, apparently is the narrative. I see the cost of heating explode. Now you're a property manager mm -hmm. and you're in the seat, and I know we don't have to deal with that down here in Florida because it's not a heating issue. Right. But in the Northeast, like, do you have any, like, thoughts on that? Like, what would it be like if you're in, like, Cape Cod and you're the property manager or Cape Cod's a bad example, but where tenant can't pay? That's the biggest risk is when the tenant can't pay. And then, and we've had that with our rental properties where 
I went in on one of the units and I noticed the furnace on the other unit and hot water tank weren't on. And I'm thinking to myself, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And further inspection, I called a gas company and the gas had been turned off for three, four months. Mm -hmm. And this was in the middle of the winter. Now, fortunately, no pipes froze. It yep. was a duplex <laughs> and it was the upstairs unit. So the downstairs unit was essentially heating, up heating there. the upstairs yep. unit. Yeah. So of course, the downstairs unit, they were starting to have trouble making rent payment. Why? Because their energy costs, right? Their gas costs were so high. Yeah. And so things like that can, of course, happen in the, in the property management business. And you really have to keep an eye on those types of things yeah. and make sure that, you know, the gas is turned on. And that is a requirement of the tenants. It's going to be in their lease agreement. But then also having some controls in place to make sure that, you know, they are uh, the gas is on because if the gas is turned off for a certain period of time, mm -hmm. it makes it that much more difficult to get that gas turned back on. Yeah, I mean, you said it. You have to keep the heat on. You have to keep the lights on. And in here in Florida, you have to keep the air conditioning on. Yep. Because first and foremost, you have to protect the asset. And so it all starts with your lease. The lease is, is, is a working document and it's very important that you, you have these things that they have to have shutters or, or some kind of window treatment that they, they have, have to, to use. By these certain rules. Yeah, you know, it, you got to use your air conditioner, you got to use your fans, you have to do the things to protect the property and the asset. And um, I mean, in, in some cases on short term rentals down here, we'll put a cap on air conditioning costs and things like that because people tend to treat it like a hotel. You know, they're, I'm staying here for three months, but I'm blasting it on down to 62 degrees every day, all day. And next thing you know, you got four, five, six hundred dollar um, electric bill. Yeah. And so, you know, you can have a cap. Ours is 250. But um, yeah, I think it all starts with the, to really answer your question. I don't know how to fix that issue. Obviously, I don't think you can. I think it's something that is worth noting yeah. that we can look That's back right. in the, our show catalog and be like in October of 2022. What does it look like for the winter? And. I just think something's going to happen. There's going to be a lot of tenants saying, I can't pay or I'm going to have to make a deal because energy is too high, you know? And I think that really goes back to finding the right tenant for the property, mm -hmm. right? Setting the right lease price, the term of the lease, and doing a good background check and, you know, making sure that's the right tenant for the property, which actually leads me to a question I want to make sure I ask is, uh, for those that want to self-manage, mm -hmm. um, there's certainly a lot of technology. You guys obviously plug into a lot of technology to efficiently manage properties. There's a lot of self-service technology. We talk a lot about property tech on this show. Mm -hmm. uh, James is an absolute uh, we'll call it guru in terms of property tech, building out IRAtitlepro.com, which is very tech-enabled. That makes it super efficient for people to use self-directed IRAs. I appreciate that compliment. Invest. He doesn't give me many. So I got, no. I got to make sure I, I, I plug IRA Title Pro, of course. Um, but uh, where I'm going with this is, you know, if I, if I am self-managing a property, how do I determine how much I should rent that property out for? You know, a lot of people I talk to, they go on, you know, Zillow Estimate, <laughs> You know, nothing against that. You know, right. that can be, I think, a good baseline. Uh, maybe looking at, you know, other like apartments.com and looking at other comparables in the market. Yeah. But how do you assess the right rent for a particular property that you're renting out? Amazing question. And there's nothing wrong with Zillow and apartments.com and all those places. We all use them. We, we utilize them to the fullest. And that's everybody does. And so um, the problem with that is when a client or a rental owner goes on there and they see all these prices, you have to keep in mind that those are the advertised prices. And there might be other prices in the background. You might be looking at a high season rent because the information that gets to Zillow through like the MLS is syndicated, right? It's automatic. But in the MLS, you may have a high season rent and a low season rent. You may have an annual rent. You're not seeing that in Zillow. You're just seeing Joe Schmo is renting his house supposedly for $8,000 a month down yep. the street. When in reality, he's only getting 4,000. Um, so the best way to go about that is, is to find a local pro, find a local property management uh, manager, a realtor, a real estate agent, because what you need to look at is not what things are being advertised for. You need to see what they're actually renting for. And you're not going to see that through these the automated computerized systems that you're that they're looking at online. So tech is great, but it doesn't show you everything. You need to get the behind the scenes numbers. And great. so call us. We'll give you the, the real rate. Great. And, and last question, I think, from me. Last, last question. Go ahead. It's, ask as um, much as you want. We is, got them here. And this is particularly for those that are brand new to, they, they, they're doing their first rental property. Because we have a lot of viewers that are on this program 
that are just getting started in real estate and they're trying to put together all the pieces of the puzzle before they go out and execute on buying their first property. Because yep. we know that the, the fear of all of these things that need to happen. And you know, my background, very analytical in terms of when I make a decision to do something, I have to make sure I know step one all the way to landing on the moon. You know, whereas some people, right, they're like off the rocket ship and, you know, then they're, I'll figure out how to land on the moon when I get there. Sure. Um, but we have plenty of folks that aren't that way. So really trying to understand everything from, from soup to nuts. So the question is, is when it comes to utilities, um, gas and electric standard, that's going to be in the tenant's names. They need to switch that over at the time of them getting the keys to the property. Mm -hmm. um, water and sewer. Um, how, how is that typically handled? You know, what, what's your guys' view on that? You know, some self-managed investors I work with, they extend that cost onto the tenant. So on a monthly basis, they tell them, they send them the bill, and then they have to include that in their monthly rent um, or as a separate payment. And then some landlords will cover the cost of water and sewer and just kind of monitor and make sure that it doesn't get out of control. But of course, it can get out of control. And then how do you have that conversation? So maybe you can touch on two part question, you know, one, um, do you extend that cost onto them? Or does the landlord absorb it? Right. And then question two, how do you manage through that in the event that the tenant starts to abuse the situation? Sure. So in most cases where it's an annual unfurnished, they're living there full time, they pay all the utilities. The only time typically down here, the landlords will be responsible for water and sewers because it's included in a condo association fee or a homeowner association fee. So therefore, each property may not be submetered. It gets paid by the master association or whatever. <clears throat> but I always recommend for the owners to, the, the, to, to require the tenant to be responsible for all their utilities because they're based on usage and yep. people will take advantage of them yep. um, because they don't know, they don't see it. And so down here, I know water and sewer is a big thing. Like call your county utilities, they don't allow the owner to take it out of their name. They allow you to add a tenant, so that gets a duplicate bill. It's attached to the property is what they call it. Yeah, so it's gonna go, it's gonna convey. So they, um, we make sure that the tenant applies for that. We actually help them do that. We, have, we put their name on it, they get the bill. Now, if they don't pay the bill, usually the company's calling us or the owner, depending on how they set it up, and we'll reach out to the tenant to make sure that they are getting it paid. Um, so, and, and you build that into the lease as well. You build out the responsibility of the tenant. Um, if you are one of those gracious landlords that want to include water and sewer, then you do have to monitor it. You got to look at your usage. What was it last year compared to this year? Has it increased? And then you might want to consider putting the cap on it so that they don't, you know, exceed a certain amount of usage, whether it's gallons or a price, that would be my suggestion. You know what they do down here in Florida? It's very interesting. They actually build in when you're actually doing the sale, the transaction, and they know that you know the owner is selling to the buyer, right? There's a built-in 25% add-on to the final bill because they believe that there's going to be 25% greater usage when somebody's getting ready to move. So, like the water use of the home is going to go up just prior to the for the moving process. Whether you're mm -hmm. cleaning the house, whether you're doing all those things, so it's really interesting because we have to look at what's the meter read date of the bill to be able to see kind of, oh, wait a minute, we can't have that buyer inherit negative balance. It's very exciting stuff. This is what we do every single day, John Bones. Mm -hmm. We're saving lives, saving water lives. But with that, I wanna say, Dave Piscaric, yes. Parkline Realty down here in South Florida. Thank you so much for taking the time and talking property management with us. My pleasure. Right, it's, uh, it's I would say from what I've heard throughout the build to rent craze, the hardest part about real estate investing, they say, and these are smart people, is the management aspect. So if you can figure out you know, the formulas for great calculations and your ROIs, you still have to be able to manage that property. And that's kind of where the rubber meets the road, right? Absolutely. Yeah, in fact, James, it, it reminded me, um, I work uh, pretty closely with uh, a gentleman. He has a PhD in real estate. They actually have PhD yeah. programs for real estate. There's only a few universities across the country that offer them. And this is a gentleman that has over 200 doors himself, both in and outside of self-directed IRAs combined over 200 doors. And what he told me is he said, John, you know, having a, a good property management company in place based on my analysis, again, this is a PH, he has a PhD in real estate. There's a 7% annual yield differential, mm -hmm. meaning if I have the right property management in place, 
whether I'm self-managing or hiring that out, that could be a difference of a 7% yield. And take that 7% over, you know, whatever that portfolio is, doesn't matter if it's big or small. And that's a that's a big differentiator. I mean, we talk about inflation. Absolutely. We sure. talk about inflation a lot, yeah. you know, on, on today's show. And I know there's people that, you know, speculate that it's actually more than what it's being reported right now at, you know, about 8.3, 8.5%. Mm. But, you know, that, um, that, that can really take out some of that sting of inflation. Yeah. How does that 7% compound over 20 years in addition to the tax savings you have with using your IRA? And that's how you build real wealth. Head over to IRATitlePro.com, take a look at the resources tab, and you'll see all the amazing stuff. Uh, we got Dave Piscaric from Parkline Realty with the Building Equity Podcast. John, we are we're staying true to our mission as we want to bring professionals that understand their discipline, their concentration, and in this case, it's property management, and we know our investors care about it, and we delivered. So hot diggity dog, we delivered. Absolutely, James. The last thing I'll say in closing for anyone that is this is your first time on the Building Equity Podcast, uh, this is the format of the show. It's very detail-oriented. Um, if you're somebody that's looking for hype and get quick rich and, you know, how can I go to this seminar and pay, you know, $5,000 and find deals, you know, that's not what this show is about. No. This show is about information, education. There's no upsell. There's no downsell. There's no side sell. This is all about providing good information for those that want to get started in real estate. And when the rubber meets the road, this is the really important stuff. This is what prevents people from buying real estate. Or it's also something that prevents people from making mistakes when they do their first real estate investment. And we're big advocates of mitigating risk. We had um, Josh on from, uh, what was Inspectify. the name of that? From Inspectify. Um, obviously, we had attorneys on some of the other shows, so you can we check out those. Tax professionals. Tax professionals. Property appraisers. Property appraisals. We even had Muhammad Ali. Did you? You didn't invite me. Yeah, I know. We missed out on it. So let me ask you this. Yes, sir. Have you ever had a Permani Brothers sandwich? I have not, no. You ever heard of it? I've, I know. I've, 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 <laughs> I've heard of it, yeah. It's pretty good. You stand by it? I'll stand by it all day. There you, you go. wings as well. Do they? And an Iron City beer. So listen, you heard it here. Dave Piscaric, Parkline Realty. John Bowens, we did it again. I'm looking forward to the next episode, my friend. Awesome. Thanks, James. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks to you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome.